The Western Balkan region has played a significant role for European security for decades. Tactics Institute is proud to present its second major report titled UAE, Saudi Arabia, Opportunism, Captive States and the Arms Trade in Southeastern Europe. The report outlines the changing relationship between the EU and the Balkans, highlighting the manufacture and sale of arms in the region. Powerful Gulf Middle Eastern states engaged in proxy wars have become the region's leading weapons customers. Today, to talk about this report, we're joined by Brigadier General Metodi Hajianov, who is a military security analyst and an associate professor at the Military Academy, General Mikhail Opostolsky in Skopje. Good evening to you. Good evening. Ivan Fischer, foreign policy reporter and analyst writing for the largest Croatian daily, Utanti List. Good evening. Good evening. And Alexander Splunovsky, a journalist specializing in diplomatic, defense, and security reporting in Macedonia and Southeastern Europe. Good evening to you too. Good evening. It's a pleasure. So let's start this discussion uh, with a why. And the why is. Why does a military procurement and investment take place from the UAE and Saudi Arabia, particularly in the Balkans? Well, um, I believe that the, uh, both countries that you have mentioned are trying uh, to find their place in the current uh, geopolitical context that is ongoing. And they're trying to use the opportunities of the vacuum that has been created in the Western Balkans with the um, uh, moving away, if I could say, uh, from the Western politics, uh, usually depicted into the European Union approach and uh, United States approach, um, move away that uh, has been created uh, uh, without uh, the losing the momentum of with the European Union and uh, largely focus of the United States to the Middle Eastern um, related issues, uh, uh, which created those security vacuum or power vacuum in the region. And they have tried to also capitalize on the uh, liberalized uh, market that has been established uh, throughout the years after the transition. So basically they are seeing this uh, as an opportunity that those uh, qualitative uh, pr uh, production of the small arms uh, fires could be used uh, as, uh, an, as a tool that can maximize their, um, their efforts uh, elsewhere, especially in uh, the areas where they have particular interest, such as in, uh, uh, let's say, in uh, Yemen, uh, where they have actually, we have uh, seen the reports where they have abused or uh, uh, transferred uh, certain types of weapon that have been banned or uh, proclaimed as a ban by the European Union uh, ATS weapons criteria. So one of the reasons is that they are trying to exploit this uh, region uh, in order to maximize their position with uh, the European Union and of course uh, to um, use it as a, a platform that can uh, later be used in negotiation with the European Union and uh, expanding their markets. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, okay. Uh, if there is no uh, concrete way of uh, how we do this, if I may. Uh, so obviously uh, we are talking about um, a region uh, which uh, has the highest uh, risk uh, of, of, of producing uh, conflicts uh, in Europe, but also a region uh, that has um, really, really small economical impact uh, in, in, in the world economy today. So regarding from this perspective, uh, for me, it's logical uh, why the Balkan countries uh, are trying to find um, uh, uh, a way how to to inject uh, a huge am amounts of, of uh, money and, and and capitals through selling um, in the given geopolitical circumstances uh, in the world selling arms and weapons so uh, discussing this uh, subject um, it's it's quite logical for me because uh, this is the region as we all know that had um, a long, long uncertain period uh, in, in, in the so-called Yugoslav Wars and therefore after the ending of the Yugoslav Wars, which have been something more than 20 years, let's say, um, there is a 
like obviously a huge stockpile of, of uh, weapons that are needed to be transported from our region there. So for me, it's quite logical that this thing happens. And obviously we have the resources, uh, sorry, the country have the resources and find the necessary perspective how to transport the arms from our region to the buyers that are. So giving in mind the, 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 the global situation and, and the development of the Middle East, like uh, groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda in the Middle East and so on and so on and so on. That's a huge developing market, which obviously some uh, centers of powers from the Balkans use uh, the opportunity in the situation to transport everything from here to there and make money in the same process. I mean, the thing about uh, weapons in the Balkans is uh, there's a burgeoning, well, an active uh, weapons manufacturing industry. There are also huge stockpiles left over from the war. And for those that remember during uh, Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia was moderately militarized state, which basically aimed to secure politically its independence from East and the West by demonstrating its force of arms. So it was, a significant uh, weapons arms producer and arms exporter and all of those factories are more or less still active in some form in the Balkan countries. Now following the Yugoslav wars, uh, the weapons production has continued, the stockpiles of all weapons have remained and what the countries have faced is an extremely competitive global market for small arms and, and larger weapons. Uh, where basically it's very, very difficult to, to break through only with quality. You have to have political connections, you have to have influence. And so it's very difficult for the Balkan countries to sell their weapons in the West, where they are usually perceived as, you know, the uh, knockoffs of Soviet weapons. So there are weapons which are difficult to sell in the West, but are have proven to be quite easy to sell in the Middle East because there is a growing demand and as long as it can be done on paper legally there is literally nothing preventing the governments from from uh, using this opportunity I mean they have the supply and they are in search of demand and demand is simply there in the Middle East mm -hmm. What would you say um, is the break in the chain of accountability that allows exports to be diverted to all regions? Well, I, I would say that um, there is, a, first of all, there is no clear EU policy on this. Uh, I mean, we can argue both ways. Yes, there is a um, 2008 EU common position on arms exports which uh, if we go and look uh, how this basically was approached by some of the main European Union or the, the most powerful European Union members, we'll see that there is a disagreement uh, among the countries, uh, even inside, uh, let's say, uh, the UK, uh, UK. Okay, now it's a bit Brexit, but uh, France and Germany, the most powerful uh, EU members, uh, they have this disagreement with this policy. Uh, though uh, Councillor Merkel has stepped on and has pushed for um, uh, this uh, provisions implementation. Uh, there was also uh, a relaxation in part of when it comes to, rec to reconsider in which part this uh, EU treaty ban has been implemented. Um, though Bulgaria and Croatia are both EU member states and then Bosnia, Herzegovina, Montenegro and Serbia are aspiration countries uh, and uh, with a different level of uh, advancement in these processes, uh, there are certain evidences that basically confirm that like the European Union countries or procurement uh, factories, there, there are evidence that confirm that there is a breach of uh, these provisions or the EU test criteria that basically uh, were violated uh, in compensation for the, in terms of liberal market prioritization and in terms of uh, profit making and uh, investment or export progress. So basically, I would say that um, um, this, uh, the problem relies on two poles. One is that uh, the provisions and the EU visions on how they wanna see um, this to be approached by EU members and on the other side is the 
the the the quest for uh, proficiency profit and the quest for uh, protecting liberal market values and uh, uh, customers there there are no uh, consequences for any established breach in in the criteria so and there are no uh, established procedures for actually establishing breaches in the criteria so it's up to every individual uh, member state to react or not to react to individual breaches of criteria so basically whenever some country finds its weapons in the hands of a third party it's up to it to decide whether or not it wants to export any more weapons to that particular country or not and uh, so far as we can see the system is not functioning i mean the countries which obviously profit from the exports uh, have no incentive to stop exporting unless they will be pressured by the entire block so there needs to be uh, an agreement uh, on, on the level of the entire European Union on what to do, how to do it, and to do it uh, equally for all members. Until that is done, I mean, every individual country will definitely use every opportunity it can to, to export the weapons it has. Mr. Spinovsky? Uh, I'm sorry. My internet broke a little bit uh, the, the, the main point is that I uh, they that I uh, um, I'm on the same line with uh, with the viewpoints of my colleagues uh, in this uh, area uh, I have to mention that um, discussing uh, a practical gray zone of uh, functioning of, of the countries which uh, there are no certain uh, criteria and routes in which the EU can monitor the situation. There is no international intervention in a sense of uh, how uh, things are regulated in this area and that's why uh, third countries and Balkan countries are using the opportunity to provide and export the ability of uh, cell weapons to different um, establishments and um, I guess the major key role problem for me in this sense is uh, not having a value system and not having the presence in, in this uh, part of the life, the practical life of the countries in, in, in the Balkans. Sorry for my slow reply. I have a problem with my net. Hope you're hearing me fine. Not to worry. It's, uh, it's slow a little bit on my side. It's fine. We can hear you. Um, Okay, so following that, um, and finally to my last question, um, can you tell us what is the captive state phenomenon and would you say that there is any evidence at all to suggest that Serbia or any other um, country are what you might term a captive state? Uh, it, it's it's uh, uh, we are talking if I may first we are talking about uh, such a wide uh, definition of of uh, of a problem uh, defining a captain state in this uh, time especially when we are talking about the European part uh, of the world it, it's hard but there are some some certain pinpoints of uh, of events uh, some certain uh, examination of international institutions and stuff that that, that can pinpoint uh, that some certain uh, areas of uh, where the Balkan countries function in general, not speaking only for Serbia, are not uh, uh, not uh, fully fulfilled uh, to, to running the countries in, uh, by the democratic principles. Um, the countries like, for example, Croatia and Bulgaria and so on that are in the, uh, in the European Union, by far uh, suppress the other regional societies in the countries. Uh, let's say, uh, for me, there is a, a lack of dialogue. For me, there is a lack of, um, uh, in the Serbian society, a lack of communication and travel from power from local to, to, to republic uh, levels, uh, from opposition parties to parliamentarian parties and, and parties involved. So uh, if you have the whole context of uh, how society works, if you have uh, the the, the, the frequent reports of the international journalistic uh, associations that are highly criticizing the, the 
government in Dorit for uh, implementing rules, uh, you know, for functioning uh, free media. And, and when you have all the pictures about all the elements, by far you can tell that this concrete country has a significant problem with practicing democracy, which for me, it's a, it's a really, really strong uh, claim that Serbia, it's, it's, it's a form of a captive state. Uh, maybe the, the one with the lowest uh, level of democracy, if you have an exact, uh, if you, if you do uh, compare it with some certain countries, maybe Kosovo or, or something like it, have a bigger, even a bigger problem than, than Serbia regarding this, this topic. So if you have um, society that's run uh, non-democratically, if you have strong party members, if you have strong uh, political forces that are running uh, the country and deciding uh, about almost every aspect of the society without transparency, without uh, free media, without free political will, which is evident in, 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 in the last uh, election cycles and, and so on and so on in Serbia, then you can concur that we are talking about at least a problematic uh, a, a, a country that has a problematic society for me. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll suggest that even goes uh, second, and I'll go the last. So because I was always I mean, first. There, there are definitely democratic deficits all over the Balkans. Uh, in some way, they are most pronounced in in Serbia, as as my colleague said, uh, primarily due to the uh, breakup of most necessary uh, democratic uh, mechanisms necessary to maintain at least a, a minimal level of democracy. Now we have a semi-functioning state definitely in, in Croatia and Bulgaria and I, I would venture a guess that most of the countries in the region have at least, they at least have an opposition, you know, which Serbia does not have. So we basically have a single party system where everything is top down decided by a single person which is not even uh de uh the the leader of government so so the current president uh, does not have uh, legal power that he wields de facto that he leads uh, practically i mean so th this is obviously a very much uh not a democracy at this point considering the the media considering the i, I think that the, the free media uh, list in serbia can now be brought down to about two or three outlets and they are basically consumed by 10 or maybe 15 percent of serbs at this point so the, the majority of serbs are reading the newspapers which are blaming the non-existent opposition for most of the current problems in the country. So this is, uh, uh, I'm afraid that this seems like a self-perpetuating machine, that this is uh, a dissolution of democratic institutions, which uh, will for the long term uh, make it not only unlikely, but nearly impossible to reestablish some democratic uh, mechanisms and criteria okay i'll uh, i'll just confirm this and put it in more of the european union context uh, uh, officially this uh, term uh, has been used in the, the context of the European Union communication uh, starting in 2017. However, in the first document, uh, it basically Balkan states uh, were put in the captive state phenomenon context in official document uh, titled a credible enlargement perspective for an um, enhanced AM engagement with the Western Balkans uh, back in 2018 where European Commission basically communicated with the Euro Parliament expressing the view of the former uh, EU uh, Commission President uh, Juncker. Uh, but basically when we talk about the captive state phenomenon we are talking about the three main 
pillars that create this phenomena, and these are vulnerable institutions that are still only an instrument of ruling parties' disposal. A fragile democratic culture and a popular understanding that corruption is incurable and in some way justified. And third, a lack of political will for change and main, uh, mindset that enlightenment corruption does not pay off. So basically, if you put this into the Balkan, Western Balkan uh, context, you will see this across, uh, starting even from, let's say, Slovenia going down to uh, North Macedonia, you will see in the practice, in the history, that there were uh, cases of uh, and scandals of uh, corruption where uh, prime ministers were involved into, into this phenomena. Uh, and put in you, to your question, does Serbia uh, fits into the profile? I would say not just them, but several countries fits in uh, to this because, and this is not us saying this, but also European Union has recognized officially that if uh, Balkan states uh, continue to uh, engage with this, uh, let's say, the three pillars that I have mentioned, they will uh, basically remain as a captive state. What is also important to mention is that um, in, in a way, uh, I'm not saying that I'm, uh, I, I don't wanna say that uh, this will be totally EU false, but in a way EU has supported this phenomenon by uh, favorizing uh, the so-called stabilocracy effect, where they have trade stability for uh, basically um, uh, more, um, let's say, uh, uh, the, the, for accountability and for the bro more broader efforts in uh, uh, putting democratic transition and uh, practicing of democracy. So I would say uh, this is, uh, 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 a result of the both uh, the uh, lost interest in the Western Balkans and the ex uh, definitely of the corrupted elites that has run uh, the transition period and are still in some way uh, in the political uh, milieu in the Western Balkans. Thank you all for this very interesting discussion and for the extremely interesting report and for your time. You're welcome. It's a pleasure. Nice to be here. Thank you. Thank you.